Hello. Hello, Darnell. This is Christian Brothers B Podcast. How you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Thank you for taking the time out with me for a minute. And Brothers B Podcast recently sat down with author Darnell Moore to talk about his latest book, No Ashes in the Fire, Coming of Age of Black and Free in America. Take a look. All right, this is Christian Brothers B Podcast, where we interview the innovative, the daring, and the bold, providing informative topics for the black LGBT. And my guest today is none other. We have an American writer, activist. He's You see him on the mic as senior editor, and you've pretty much seen him all around. He's on a major, major book tour, and I've seen him in several places, and I'm I'm very glad to have him, privileged to have him on the show, Mr. Darnell Moore. How you doing, Darnell? Pretty good. I'm grateful to be on with you. Thank you, thank you so much. And you know, it seems like I mean, you guys are you having a very a great time with this uh, book tour. I see you everywhere now. <laughs> We've been traveling a lot. Um, it's been an amazing tour. I've met some amazing people around the world, around the country, and uh, yeah, I, I'm an introvert, so I wasn't sure how this would go. <laughs> 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 having a show up in so many places, but it's be my occupation. Uh, well. Well, I hope this is breaking out your introvert. But you, but you know what? I, the more I, I look at your writing, you know, I, I'm, then again, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you could probably tell me when it comes to being an introvert, how does that contribute? Because it seems to do extremely well when it comes to your writing. So you know what's what's different about writing is that I can write alone, and except that when you're writing for the public, you do have to prepare yourself for what is to come when you're put there in the world. So you're writing alone, but you're always, always writing in community. Um, and not just reading it and getting at, insight into my life, but insight into the lives of people I love. Um, and, and you know, in some way in relationship to whether that's family or not. So it takes a lot of strength. Well, that, that was one of my questions here, because when I look at this book, I'm thinking to myself, okay, before he even sat down to even write one line, what was going through your mind? The thing that was going through my mind is how can I write a book, one, that's beautiful. Um, and by beautiful, that's all, you know, that's, I leave that up to the reader to judge. But in my mind, I wanted to write an artful book, a book that was, that, that had sentences that sang, a, a book that had musicality, a book that represented the best of the Black people I've come to love and know, of my community, of my city, a love letter to my city, a love letter to Black young people, especially the young people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and that are not conforming, um, young people who come from places that have been called the ghetto and the hood. And I wanted to write to young people and as a way of sort of writing back to the self, writing the book that I needed when I was young. Um, those were all the thoughts that were in my head right away. And I wanted my family to be proud. Gotcha. Yeah, and so how do you feel about it? They, my family is very supportive. They love it. Um, I had an uncle who read it. I got the book on his birthday. And my mother, uh, my sister, uh, and other, and other family members had been totally supportive. And, uh, and that makes me happy to know that they're, ha- to know that they're happy. Now, this is a book that pretty much is a memoir, but also goes into many other things pertaining to your life in Camden, New Jersey. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a memoir, but it's also a, a book that is a, a social history too. Um, it is meant to give context about not only Camden, but what was going on in the time in which I was born. So that would be, um, you know, the eighties and the nineties. This right. is a time of sort of, uh, the war on drugs, crack epidemic, the, the sort of centering, the center of the, of the growing mushroom of hip hop. It was also the AIDS, the, the moment when AIDS epidemic was ravaging our community. So it's a book that captures not only my personal life, but also a bit of the history around that moment as well. Well, you started writing this book, you know, because usually, you know what, maybe I'm kind of off when I say this, but when it comes to writing a book, you usually have an end goal. Of course, that particular end goal, I'm thinking, is for your audience to, you know, definitely adopt to it. But do you think of, you know, the amount of accolades at the same time that you may possibly get from this, et cetera? No, you know what? Like, there are some people who write books for that reason, you know? Like, you write a book sometimes because people want to be bestseller and authors. And I think that that's an admirable goal. Um, my goal really, though, was to first would touch the lives of young black people that I would be proud of, what I would be beautiful. Those were my first thoughts 
the, acc- the accolades don't mean anything. And because usually that's what people, they, they kind of go for the ring, you know, and don't get me wrong. You know, this, <laughs> everyone wants to be the LeBron of something. You know, I get it. Yeah, I totally get it. You know, but when it came down to this particular book, a lot of reviews are coming extremely, extremely well in your favor in terms of how well this book, because I've interviewed uh, several Lambda winners, you know, so I, I have a good mm-hmm. record to uphold. So. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So I'm sure you're going to be in that in that well. Now there was a couple of lines that comes out that to me seems beautiful. You know, I think it was a particular line that came down when it comes to queerness is magic for those brave enough mm-hmm. to make use of it, but it can feel poisonous for those who have yet to give in to its power. It's some, it's a line that so many people have repeated to me over the last several weeks, and what I meant by that is that to be completely free from society's um, expectations of who we are to be, to to embrace oneself, one's truth, one's attractions, one's personhood, despite the law, the sermons, um, the, you know, a community that says, if you adhere to your truth, we shame you, um, you might also, we might also legislate something, yeah. so that you can't be who you are, um, and in some cases, we might harm and hurt you, but to live in one's freedom and one's truth, in spite of all those things, that's the magic. Yeah, that's magic to 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 create a self out of the ashes, right? That comes from um, all of which, all of the things that have been said. Uh, you know, all that we've we've been told, queer people have been told no so many times, but to say yes to oneself is to commit an act of magic, and that's that's really what I was trying to get at. And, you know, a lot of people, when it comes to that process, do you believe your book kind of helps along with that process in terms of finding the truth? I hope so. I mean, you know, that's for the reader to determine, but I really do. I wrote it for for someone who might need some light in the midst of a dark tunnel. I wrote that for that person, and I'm hoping that they can find it. I mean, I I got a a little message in my Instagram box from a, a, a rising senior from Elizabeth, New Jersey, who wrote me and said that the book had really moved him, moved him to the point that he was going to, they have to do dramatic presentations um, as like final projects because he's in the debate team, the forensic team. And he's choosing to dramatize the book. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I got teary eyed because when I think about the person that I imagine reading it and being most moved by it, it was absolutely a 17 year old young person from a city like Elizabeth, New Jersey. You know, when I when I come across, you know, because one of the things that I I really really didn't realize that I was following you until last year. And then when the book came out, I'm like, oh, let me see. Can I find him on Twitter? I was already following you. And one of the things that actually pulled me in was the article that you wrote pertaining to black men loving black men is a revolutionary act. And I that's what got me. That's what got me. And I said, wait a minute. You know, this is a this is a good good piece here. You know, who actually wrote this? And that's when I said, okay, let me just uh, follow this particular writer. And then when the book came out, that's what kind of, you know, brought me right back to to you again. And when it came down to, first off, you know, some of your articles, again, are, they, they really look so much inside, you know, to where when it comes to finding whatever truth you're looking to find and, and the descriptions that you're looking to find, you do it so well. When it comes to describing and writing anything, how intimate do you really want to get to that piece and that concept? How, how intimate and closely is that important to you? I really try to write in such a way that the reader can walk away having felt the thing that I was feeling in the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That requires description. Like I, I want readers to feel, I want them to to sweat. and to. That requires description. It, it requires one to really write with, the, with the sort of mind, heart um, of the reader in mind. And that, that's critical to me. If right. you can't feel it, then I'm like, if I can't feel it, I don't even write it, you know? Really? And I've written things that I can't feel, and over the, the pieces I hate. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's so many things out in the world that I just wish I could take, snap my finger and disappear. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, well, well, give, well, give me, describe something that to, you don't necessarily point one out, but describe something that you just said. No, this. Why did I even put this out? Yeah, uh, it's a good. 
I can tell on myself. There's a piece I will uh, okay. like that was uh, a counter argument to you know people were saying let's get rid of these uh, monuments of racist people, which we should. Um, but I was also trying to provide another re- rationale for why keeping them up can be a means for us holding people accountable. Yeah, you know. Uh-huh. Um, so so many times, if you get rid of the of, of the, the sort of monuments that beckon or at least bring our hearts and minds back to say racist, it's easy to just remember that those people existed. And then, you know, the founding fathers were whatever. Yeah. Um, I hate the article. <laughs> <laughs> Partly because it was an article that, uh, you know, it it was one of the things my editor wanted me to try, and I did. It wasn't from my heart. You know, it wasn't something that I felt. Yeah. And that is one of the the challenges of working with the the media, digital media, mainstream media, um, the way that pitches are done and the way that sometimes we can be creative about responding to the needs of our employers. Right. When they may not even die with what we were really feeling, like that wasn't some shit that I felt in my heart. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. And um, so, but you, but definitely social causes touches you because clearly you're you're an activist. So it's definitely one. Oh yeah, that I mean, absolutely. And I mean, I don't make really no arguments. I, I do. I try to make an argument, even article. But I tend to love the writings that are coming from my spirit. Gotcha. Like they are not germinating from outside of me, but like the yep, middle of the night. Um, you know, when I'm walking down the street, I'm like, I have to this point that's coming to my mind. I have to write about this. That's when I know like the spirit is moving through through the pen, or through the or through the keypad. You know, and those are the things that it's, it's. I've been trained as a preacher, so it's like when you write a sermon. I remember days where the the the, the time where I'm supposed to preach is coming. I'm talking about like hours away. Yeah. And I would sit there until I felt moved by the quote unquote spirit. Like I could not just write something down and get up in front of people and preach if I didn't feel like it was coming from spirit. That's the same way about the words that I put on the page. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My consciousness, you know, and I also believe in the like tradition as African people, you know? Right. Um, the rhythm of the spirit of, of something bigger than us, of our ancestors, is a real thing. It that is. even if we don't name, name that or call it, like our writing and our writing, the way we move in the world, um, our expressions are all so animated by like the musicality that is spiritual moving in our lot. It's, it just is, you know? Yeah, yeah. You think writing is your ministry? I believe that I'm called to be to, to, be to transformative justice. And what I know is any tool, any skill that I have ought to be used toward that end. If that's writing, if that's a pen on camera, if that's using the camera to capture what's happening in the world, if that's organizing in the street, if that's teaching in the classroom, if that's telling a person, a stranger on the street that I love them and I need to give them a dollar so they can eat, all of those things are routes towards what I understand my calling to be. Wow. I like that. I like that. So... In terms of right, right now, the people who are actually being affected by this book, so far it definitely seems that, you know, you've, you've not even prior to this book, your writings definitely have something about it that has a certain intimacy. That's why when I read the first article, like I said, that's what really kind of turned me on to you a little bit more. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, you know, if this particular book comes into a movie, <laughs> who would you want to play this part of you? That's interesting. I, you know... Just recently, uh, I had this conversation, um, only because, like, it's become a bit more closer to an, something other than an idea, you know? Um, and I honestly don't know. That, that's a tough, that would, yeah, that's a tough question mm-hmm. now because I, be, because I'm thinking to myself, okay, for a memoir to someone to actually be you growing up in Camden, mm-hmm. New Jersey and experiencing the experience that you have, is definitely going to take that type of actor that you would also kind of shares uh, a love of the intimacy of emotion and feeling as well and able to convey that on the screen. That, that would be probably kind of tough. That's what I had to ask you, though. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had to ask you that question only because I'm thinking to myself, if this ever becomes a, a film, it would definitely be someone who has to really bring that in, you know, to actually accept that as well. So when it comes down to the next, well, first of all, the tour, your, is your tour almost up or you still got a lot more places yeah, to go? Yeah, it's almost up. Okay. <laughs> well, 
the, the, the thing about Atura is that because books momentum goes up and down, you sort of never are off tour. Um, now, what I can say is that we did develop like a full month of things. Um, it's much slower. Um, we have some things that will kick in once fall comes on. Colleges will be back on campus. You know, folk will be back on campus. I did an event last night, uh, August 2nd at Brooklyn Historical Society. I, I mean, I travel out a few more times in August, but it's not as intense as it were. Um, I have, I, it's, it's been a, it's been a lot. Yeah. It's been a lot. And it's been beautiful. Well, that's, I mean, so what's the plans once the tour may subside a little bit? So I'm imagining that it will subside probably mid fall. Okay. Um, and I need it to subside because I have to, <laughs> you know, I want to start working on a second project and um, I want to make sure that I dedicate time and energy to that. You know, some things I learned from the first book process and it's not only about how to get a book done and the type of space I need to create to do that. Who are writing, writing isn't always a full time thing, you know. So yes. Work and to write which is another type of labor happening. I, I just need time carved out so I can get a second project started. You know, I, I also have a friend who's actually writing a book here, and how he describes his process is exhausting. <laughs> it is an exhausting process to write a book. Do you share those same, uh, those same, those same uh, uh, ideas? I do. It, it's exhausting. It's hard. It's beautiful. It's messy. It breaks you open. It humbles you. It is transcendent um, to be able to have a vision, something that starts out as an, as an only a vision and to wake up one day and hold that vision, a material <laughs> a consequence of that vision in your hand. Yeah. It's such a beautiful thing. It really is. I, I sit back sometimes and go, I don't know how I did this. I mean, I was writing when my father passed away. Oh, wow. He passed away while I was writing the book. Um, I was primarily alone by myself. I went to that place in Atlanta and was down there writing. Um, you know, life was still happening. I was still having ups and downs and ebbs and flows and kind of intimate relationships and dating. Um, family stuff was going on. Um, all manner of things, you know, health. And you still, you write, you know. Um, and and what by write, I mean trying to figure out how to put words on page that make sense to a public outside of you. Words that you hope somebody can find beautiful, that can they can find meaning in. All of that at the same time. Wow. All of that. It's it's a process. Now, what part of the book touches you the most? That's a good question. Uh, probably the parts about my parents. Um, I really did try to make um, like make sure that I honor them and uh, write them as complex human beings who deserve um, attention, like they're a representative of so many black folk, I think, who don't get to show up at people's books. And I wanted to make sure that I honor them and my city. Yeah. Yeah. You know? You know. Really, New Jersey, if I should name that, I, want to make, I wanted to make sure that I honor my city. Yeah. My hometown, Camden, New Jersey, which has been um, divided by so many within mainstream media since I, even before I was born. And I, I wanted to challenge that narrative that the, that the city I come from is, is sort of um, a hopeless, nihilistic city because it's full of black and brown people um, are not cultural pathologians that uh, that turn cities into ghettos. That is what it is. Myself, and it was important. I write it with that. Now, what does Camden, New Jersey mean to you? What is it? What does Camden say to you? It, it's a story of um, survival. It's a story of complex humanity. Um, it's a story uh, about finding both how how any of us can have within us monsters and love, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's a it's a critique of the fire that is America, of the fire that is heterosexism and antagonism toward queer and trans people, of the fire um, that is patriarchy and the fire that so many black people somehow, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Old Testament, learn to live through. Now, it would be better 
if we didn't have to survive through the fire, if we didn't have to create family in the fire, if we didn't have to learn to love and, 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 and live and laugh in the fire. Um, but it is a testament to the strength of a people who are able to do so. America, the fire is always burning, and it's a testament to our strength and the call of critique to the very systems that have tried to snuff us out, snuff us, you know, to take us out of here. So when it comes to the how you see black queer folks, men and women of yeah. today, what how do you, what do you see in today's world? I mean the same. Um, black queer transgender nonconforming people are magicians. Um, they are in so many ways the the wizards, uh, you know, the witches, the people who have magic within our communities who are not only shape shifting. Um, into selves that, that are more, uh, you know, that, that are more truthful and honest about who they are. But so many of us are the caregivers in our communities too, who are fighting on behalf of everyone in our community, even when everyone in our communities are not fighting for us. Um, the movement for black lives, which has emerged over the last several years, um, of, of which p- people like Patrice Cullors have written about in her book, um, when they call you a terrorist, really attest to the fact that so many of the people who have been at the forefront of the movement for black lives have been black, queer, transgender, non-conforming folk who have taken to the front line on behalf of everyone, all the blacks, yeah. <laughs> even when all the have not stood up for or are attended to the needs of, of LGBTQ folk in our community. Wow. Well, you know, one thing about this, I, I want to ma- urge people, and if I didn't say the title before, excuse me, No Ashes in the Fire, Coming of Age, Black and Free in America. Uh, so I definitely want to ma- urge people to go out there and buy this book because to me, you know, it one, to actually see your writing, again, to, to see how intimate and how really you, you, you actually really get for the person to feel it. Um, so of course, you know, anything else you do, you know, you got several things you've been doing for quite some time. You going to plan on slowing down anytime soon? Um, that's a good one. (laughs) You know, I, (laughs) I I guess I'll slow down when at some point, you know, my body every now and then has a way of slowing me down, but uh, I want, I always say, I just want to be able to do my little part in this big well. And that means I need to always be ready to respond to how the spirit moves me to work. Um, so as long as I have energy, I guess I'm going to be working. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the best place to keep moving. No ashes in the fire. Again, this is Chris from Brother Speak Podcast with Donnell Moore. Uh, again, I do appreciate you taking the time out. It was a little choppy for us to try to get together. I understand it. It's a busy schedule. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm, I'm not going to do this podcast with them. <laughs> no, I, I said, you know, I, I have a, I, one of the things I will say is that it's important for me to make sure I talk to my people. Oh, wow. um, and that means so much to me so I'm glad that we were able to meet this time and I actually stayed in the late office by myself <laughs> while everybody else left and so I talked to you um, because I wanted to make sure that we got it done so thank you um, so I appreciate much. being patient and gracious and thanks for having me on Thank you so much, Donnell Moore. Again, No Ashes in the Fire. Please, There will be a link in the podcast so everyone can click on and go check out that book. It's a lot, to, lot, a lot of reading. It talks about his life. He goes really deep into it, so I'm sure you'll appreciate it. Again, this is Chris with Donnell Moore. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye. Thank you so much, Donnell. Really appreciate it.